Good afternoon, guys. It's about four o'clock. And a good time for a little bit of a lecture for uh, chapter 12. I hope you guys are going to do well on your third ex or your fourth exam. This begins uh, the first uh, chapter of three, which will be included on your fifth exam. Hope you've been using your time wisely. Anyway, here we are with chapter 12, and you see the title of it is The Central uh, Nervous System. And <clears throat> that's going to include what structures? How about a brain and a spinal cord, right? So as you look on page 425, you'll see it'll give you the overview of the uh, central nervous system. When you come down the second paragraph, a few things that just want to put a little note by them, we will get into them more deeply. And the uh, second column talks about the brain, and it mentions about six lines down that it has cavities inside the brain. You've heard people say, oh, so-and-so's got a hole in his head. And we think of them as not being able to think as well as we do or whatever. You know, people just talk like that. But anyway, we do have cavities inside our head, inside our brains. So when you come down to line six, you're going to see a word that you would probably associate with the heart. It talks about the cavities called ventricles. So you got ventricles in your heart, got two of them. And then you have ventricles in your brain, spaces in your brain. And there is a fluid that flows through there called cerebrospinal fluid. Think about how does it flow? What makes it flow? What's it produced by? What is the fluid? Where does it come from? So anyway, we'll get into that um, a little bit later. Anyway. Uh, you come on down to the second paragraph in that second column, and it talks about how the brain needs about 20% of the blood that we have in our body. It is working all the time, even when we're asleep. It's working. Of course, our heart is too, right? And other structures like our GI tract and our kidney and so forth. But the brain takes about 20% of our uh, blood and the other nutri nutrients that are in there. So as you see in the third paragraph, it mentions, it talks about the brain. Of course, there are a number of parts, but we're going to be interested in the cerebrum. Put it on the first thing, fourth finger there. Um, the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. So as you look down below, you see um, some short uh, information about it. Uh, we're not going to get into tremendously deeply, but we do want to know these parts and we want to know what those parts do, at least to some degree. We're not going to, we just can't get into all of it because we just don't have the time to do it. Yeah, I'm so glad, right? Yep. Okay. So you see, in the, you've got the cerebrum, and that's the biggest part of our brain up here, the top. You're going to be able to see a picture of it on the next page. And uh, it's composed of two halves, and so they call them hemispheres, and you see as you come on down through the little blurb on cerebrum there, it talks about, or it mentions higher mental functions, and so there's a lot of thinking that goes on up here, uh, language and so forth, <clears throat> being caution, conscious, conscious, it says conscience, language and conscience, uh, conscious means you're aware. Conscience, S-C-I-E-N-C, -E is what we talk about when we think, ooh, there's that part of me that says, I wish I hadn't said that. It's that sense in our soul that we have done something that was not the wisest thing to do or maybe even just blatantly wrong. You know how we can do that. So anyway, um, that's part of the cerebrum. You see the diencephalon. We're going to mention four parts, but we're only going to be dealing with two of them. But notice under the diencephalon, and you come to the bottom of the little blurb on the diencephalon, and you see homeostatic 
mechanisms. You remember when we covered that at the first of the semester? Mm. All over the body. And this little fellow, the diencephalon, is in control of many of those homeostatic mechanisms. Regulation of um, biological rhythms like sleeping and being awake and so forth. So just a little blurb there, cerebellum. Uh, that's toward the back and the bottom underneath. We'll see it in just a second. Notice as you come down about four lines, it talks about the coordination of movement. Knowing what you want to accomplish and the cerebellum helps you accomplish that movement. Gymnasts, basketball players, um, football players, as they, they go through motion, especially like the wide receivers, and they, they dive up in the air to catch the ball and so forth, and the whole body is helping them do that. So the cerebellum is involved in um, sports, but notice also it's involved in playing instruments, pianos. This is movement. Playing a cello or a, a violin or something like that with the left hand, depending if you're right-handed with your bow, then your left hand is going to be doing all kinds of things and you're going to be concentrating on the bow maybe. It makes it all possible. You're controlling two structures, hitting the strings at the right time, covering them. That's what the cerebellum does. Plays a role in it. And then you see the brain stem, and uh, it has, if you come down line three there, it talks about involuntary homeostatic functions. Okay. We're just full of those mechanisms. We just touched on a few, like controlling your body heat or body pressure or sugar in the bloodstream. There are lots of homeostatic mechanisms. And then once you get past the brain stem, you're into the spinal cord. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So on page 426, you see a nice colorful picture of the um, a side view of the brain. And you can see the, the structure up top this is the cerebrum, a big purple, purple structure that looks like a little bit, kind of like an egg. That's your diencephalon. And then you come on down to the um, brain stem, and then you've got the cerebellum, which is that kind of an orangey pink or something like that. I don't know what they call it. Maybe it's peach colored, my wife could tell you. She knows colors better than I do. But notice over on the right, you see the functions of those four structures. Basically, a little bit of what we talked about just a moment ago, but you want to know that. Now, if you will look at the first column on 426, come down to the second paragraph, you'll see it says both the brain and the spinal cord consist of white matter, which means that the neurons are mild, the axons, excuse me, the axons are myelinated, and the gray matter, the axons are not myelinated. And so so when somebody tells you someone says not using the gray matter, you know what neurons are they're not using supposedly. They really are. But you know, we all have to develop our thinking skills. We have to be challenged. We have to you know this works with this and this and this and to get a whole picture. So it, it's it's growing. That's why sometimes just looking at goofy stuff all day long, that doesn't do anything for your brain, it kind of dumbs you down. So uh, we need that challenge and so forth. Now, I want you to look at the, the last sentence in that first little paragraph. It says, each lobe of the cerebrum. Well, before we go there, look at the brain right down below. Excuse me, I forgot ahead of myself here. You can see the kind of light brown. They call that gray matter. That's the non-myelinated or unmyelinated neurons and ax or axons. And then you see the white matter. Well, that's the one that's got the, the myelin. And we talked about how the myelin helps speed an impulse along. You come over to the second column and you see the word tracks and nuclei. We talked about that, didn't we? We sure did. Let me move that over just a little bit there. Yeah, we talked about that. Tracks or 
in the um, bundle, they're bundles of white matter, and you have tracks within the central nervous system. And so my, there's a myelinated axon. And you see nuclei, that's clusters of uh, neuron cell bodies. And of course, they don't have any kind of um, myelin on, on the body. So let's go over now to page 428. And you see we're in module 12.2 and entitled The Brain. So now we're getting down to some of the specific components that make up the four main structures of the brain. So as you look at the pictures, and these have got some illustrations uh, uh, over to the left and the bottom. The one there that's um, uh, over to the right and up, I think that's probably a picture of a real brain. That's what it looks like if you were to take it out of our skull. You reckon they'll ever get where they can transplant a brain? That would be weird. Got a lot of connections, don't you? And it just doesn't seem like that's going to be possible. It's one thing to do a heart, do a kidney. Mm. How'd you like to wake up and be thinking something else if they could do something like that and all the information stored there? And you've got my brain. And even though you're a, a nurse, you say, oh, I've got to go teach classes. It's crazy. I don't think that's going to happen. Anyway. As you look at the side view of, uh, they call it a lateral view of the uh, cerebrum, you see these labels and you want to know those parts. You see the, the lobes of the cerebrum, the frontal, the parietal, the occipital, and the temporal. There are actually five lobes. Four are observed easily. But I want you to just come down to the bottom right, and you see where they have a couple of uh, claspers or whatever they call them. I'm not sure what the surgical term would be for that, hooks or whatever, but they pull apart the temporal, the parietal, and the frontal. Now, they don't have to tear tissue to do that. They just pull it apart, and underneath is another lobe called the insula. And so there's your fifth cerebral lobe. Now, you actually have 10 because if you look over to the left picture, see that big groove going all the way down? And they don't even name that. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I see the little line. I missed it. They call it the longitudinal fissure that splits the brain into two parts. And when you get deep in there, there's some connections that we've got to talk about because our brain functions as a whole but it has components that carry out certain responsibilities, just like a team, okay? Team's got parts, but they function as a whole. So as you look at the lobes, you want to know those. You want to see the central sulcus up at the bottom, excuse me, top left. Sulcus is a shallow groove. It's kind of like a little creek or something as opposed to a deep river. And if you've got a little shallow area, then you've got some area that's higher than that groove. The sulcus is the groove. Gyrus is the raised area on the side of the sulcus. It's kind of like a little a mountain here, a mountain here, and a valley. Okay. A couple of, sul a couple of gyri over here, and the depression is called a sulcus. So you want to know those terms. Uh, you see central sulcus. Uh, you look to the right, and you see precentral gyrus. Okay, that's a raised area. Precentral before, and then postcentral gyrus. That's another uh, raised area uh, on the back side or the um, posterior side of the central sulcus. Just landmarks. That's what they are. So when they start talking about these landmarks, you know where the what they're talking about. They give you another picture down here at the left, and you can see the same terms we were just looking at. And so you see the precentral gyrus, central sulcus, postcentral gyrus. And we're going to talk about some of the functions they do in a few minutes. Okay, so 
we've got what we what I want you to know um, about the um, the overall appearance. Now, a couple of things here that I'm going to get you to point out. Look at the top picture. This is on 428. And you see temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and frontal lobe. Now, notice there's a lateral fissure associated with that. That's where those lobes come together. And there is a deeper than a sulcus, a deeper groove than a sulcus. And they call it the lateral fissure. So what they're doing with those claspers is they're pulling apart those components down on the bottom right picture. Look down in the fissure and there's the insula. So you got the lateral fissure, you got the longitudinal fissure, and then I want you to look at the picture at the upper right, and you see where it says occipital lobe? You see the dark crevice right below that? That's called the transverse fissure. So you got a longitudinal fissure, a couple of lateral fissures on the side, and you have one transverse fissure. Those are the deeper valleys, as opposed to a sulcus being a, a shallow valley. Now, let's come down over on page uh, 429. And there um, you see lobes of the cerebrum. And you see frontal lobes. Now, here you're picking up a few um, thoughts about the functions. And so when you come down to the last couple of lines, you see the neurons of the frontal lobe are responsible for planting. Planting as well as planning. Are you planning? Have you planned to study tonight? We have choices to make. So you have uh, planning, executing movement, complex mental functions. Uh, some of you maybe do word puzzles or maybe you do math puzzles or something like that. And it also controls behavior. And they got conscience in there. Um, I'm not real sure about that. Personality, and then you come to parietal lobes, and you see that they're involved. You look at the last couple of sentences, and you see it says integrating sensory information and function in attention, paying attention to what I'm saying. So your parietal lobes certainly need to be uh, activated. Mine do too. Temporal lobes, you look at the last couple of sentences, and again, they're going to give you the functions of hearing language, memory, emotions, and they're going to do a few other things too. They're going to mention olfactory responses and gustatory uh, responses, those are being smelling and, and tasting. Occipital lobe is concerned, you look at the last sentence, vision. I had a friend in the military with me who got an infection called cryptococcal meningitis. It went back to the back part of his brain and it ruined his occipital lobe. There was nothing wrong with his eyes, but he couldn't discern what he was seeing now. He could see light and sort of vague uh, grays and darkness and so forth in light areas. Uh, but he made it through the infection, but it ruined his occipital lobe. So he's really blind. Not from the eyes, but the area that interprets what you're looking at, that was damaged. So, nothing we can do about that. Then you see the insula. And notice the last um, part about the insula, the last sentence down there. The neurons of the insula are currently thought. Don't, I keep telling you this. Don't think science has got it all figured out. We don't. We know enough to help people. You will know enough how to help people and make a living and be a blessing in their lives. But we do not have it all figured out by any stretch of the imagination. Four twenty-nine, second column. Functionally, the most complex part of the brain is the region of gray matter. You remember how the gray matter was on the outside of all the gyri and so forth? 
known as the cerebral cortex. Now, one thing I want you to um, look at is, is that first paragraph. And look at the last sentence in that paragraph. The many convolutions, the many gyri and sulci. Those uh, sulci, they say. Some people say sulci. That's another problem with the English language. We're not very consistent in some respect. But the many convulsions, not, not convulsions, but convolutions of the gyri uh, give the neocortex quite a large surface area. Think about the surface area of a cell, and if it has microvilli, like we have talked about a little bit, increases the surface area. And so we can pack a lot of surface area into our brain through those convolutions. If we didn't have those, we'd have to have big heads to get all that area in there. Now, let's go over to page 430. Get a nice color, uh, colored um, image of the cerebrum. And you see some of the terms that we were talking about. If you uh, look, say, start from the uh, bottom left, you see Broca's area. That's an area that's involved with speech. You come around to, you keep on coming to the right, you see primary auditory. That's in the temporal lobe. Another auditory association in the temporal lobe. Wernicke's area. Mm, that's up there on the parietal lobe, and that is involved with language. How do we know that? Well, if somebody has a stroke, we look at the area that had that blood vessel burst or get clotted, clogged, and that tissue died, and so that tissue now no, does no, no longer functions. Oh, that area of the body must control, let's say, the lips and the tongue, help you enunciate. Okay, so we're Nikki's area, Broca's area, they're involved with um, speech and language. Then you see the visual association, primary visual cortex. That's all about the occipital lobe. And then you, you come on up around, uh, on, you look at the face of a clock around one or two o'clock, you see a somatosensory, and primary somatosensory. That means it picks up information. It receives information. I got into some poison ivy this past Saturday. And I was trying to be real careful, but it wasn't careful enough. And I got all these little things broken out. I don't know if you can see them very well. They're itching a little bit. I'm aware of that itching. That's being picked up by the somatosensory cortex, which is behind the central surface, post central, okay, behind the central solar You move on around, and you see um, where it's this primary motor cortex. You see the blue and the red there? The blue is uh, sensory, and then the little groove between there is the central sulcus, and then the primary motor cortex involves me wiggling my fingers, going out, the messages going out to my um, skeletal muscles and so forth. So, Having said that, you can look down on page 430 and 431. On 430, you see the column number one. 431, you see the first column. And it mentions basically what we just talked about. Just the basic functions, okay? We just don't have time to get into all that. And say, it's not being a neurosurgeon. you got to know all that stuff and more than that. Now, we're looking at what happens on the outside. But remember, we got all those parts, but they're connected together. So as you look on page 432, figure 12.7, and look right above there, and you see cerebral white matter. White matter, myelinate. Okay? And you want to look at commissural fibers. You see it says it connects the right and left cerebral hemispheres. Remember, we've got two parts up here. We've got to have some connection because it has to work as a unit, see? So come down, look at the picture. 
the illustration and you see the purple. Some of you may have a better description of the purple. It's almost kind of the color of my t-shirt, isn't it? But anyway, commissural fibers of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum connects the right hemisphere with the left hemisphere. So we have unity. It can work as a unit. You look over, you look underneath the commissural fibers up above, and you see projection fibers. They're the ones that are green. So look down in the, um, the cross section there. The side, it's actually a frontal view, isn't it? A frontal section. That'd be a good question. What kind of a picture is this in terms of is it anterior, posterior, lateral, sagittal? There are some questions like that. You see those green structures called projection fibers. And you see, see that they make the different gyri, the different raised areas, connect with each other. Now, think about the connections that have to be made. Think about made. Think about your house, how it's wired. Now, you didn't have to run through the house and try to figure out what turned on the breakfast light. You knew that the switch was wired from the fuse box, through the wall, maybe up over the ceiling or something like that. It comes down into a, a light, maybe with a fan and some light fixtures on it. People put that together so that it works well. Got all these connections, so everything works together well. Top of the second column, the association fibers, or also, it says, restricted to a, sing, a single hemisphere. Connect the gray matter of cortical gyri. Another, another, another kind of connection there between adjacent gyri. Got to have those connections. Now, let's move over to uh, page 433. And again, look at the picture up top. And you see on the right-hand side, gray matter and white matter. Nice picture for that. Gray matter and white matter. Come down to the bottom of 433. We're done with the cerebrum to some degree in terms of function and structure. We're going to look at the diencephalon. So go over to page 434. And here you have some pictures of the diencephalon. And they'll tell you, if you look at the top of page 434, excuse me, it'll mention the four components of it. Now, we're only interested in two, just two. So we want to look at the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Now, you see what the thalamus looks like. And this is not going to make a whole lot of sense to you at this point. You kind of have to build up through this in terms of what it says in the third line. Between these two masses is a cavity known as the third ventricle. Now, that third ventricle is not a big cavity like this. It is a very narrow cavity. Very narrow. But fluid can flow through it. How does that fluid move? You already know the answer. We covered it back in another chapter. Read it again, okay? So you got this cavity called the third ventricle. We'll get into it in a little bit. And now I want you to notice, come down under ventricle, come down one, two, and it says thalamic nuclei receive input from multiple sources, including the cerebral cortex, the cerebellum. You don't have to worry about basal nuclei, structures of the limbic system and all that, the sensory system. Some people think of the thalamus as a train station where when trains come in, they're directed to go to various places. So this is where incoming sensory information reaches and the thalamus sends it out to the appropriate places so that the information is accepted, integrated, 
worked on, thought about, and we have a response. But everything basically has to come in through the thalamus. So as you come down, where you saw limbic system and you see sensory, except for the sense of smell, their main input travels to the cerebral cortex. The thalamus is literally the main entrance into the cerebral cortex. So it's kind of like a station where it separates stuff, sends it to the right places. Got to be wired correctly. Be a mess if didn't. So now you know about the thalamus. Come on down to the hypothalamus. And that's not everything in the thalamus, but we just can't cover all of that. But you go to hypothalamus. What does that mean? Hypothalamus. How many of you thought it said, that means it's under the thalamus. You'd be correct. Okay? See those words, those vocabulary words you're learning? you got to put them into practice. Now, come on down into the hypothalamus. Come in by the fourth and fifth line. Don't let the small size fool you. Just amazing, very small little creature, but a uh, little uh, structure. But it performs functions that are vital to our survival. Yeah, it says some of these go up to the top of page 435. And you see, play a role in the autonomic nervous system. Don't call it the automatic. The sleep wake cycle. Think about that for a minute. Think about the products on the market. Somonex. There's some other things too that are supposed to help you sleep. I think it's, uh, gosh, I lost the word already. But anyway, it's uh, melatonin, I think it is now. Not melanin, but melatonin. Okay? And that's supposed to help you sleep. So you have to wonder, see, maybe it has an influence on that component of the brain. Yeah. You know, next paragraph says, in addition to these roles, the hypothalamus uh, has a close and functional connection to the pituitary gland. Got a little stalk that goes from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. That stalk, that little structure, is called an infidibulum. In the world is that picture with something that connects things. You can see it at the bottom of page 1210, where you see the thalamus, you see the epithalamus and the pineal gland and all that. But go to the left, you see the hypothalamus, and then you see the infundibulum that connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. Now, why is that important? Because if you go back up to this paragraph on 435, you see this right in the middle of the paragraph. Um, hypothalamus secretes a variety of hormones that affect the pituitary gland. Hypothalamic releasing or inhibiting hormones. For instance, if you're, you need to make your metabolic rate faster, your hypothalamus knows that produces what it calls um, thyroid releasing factor. I believe it is thyroxin releasing factor. But it goes down to, from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. The pituitary gland produces thyroid stimulating hormone because the thyroid releasing factor came down and said, get busy, get on down to the thyroid gland. All right, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, comes down to your thyroid. Your thyroid produces thyroxin. Next thing you know, you're a little warmer. Your blood pressure is a little higher. You're burning a little food a little faster, and your body warms up. All those steps have to take place, and they do it very well, don't they? I've got a friend that might not work too well with him. If it's not 95 degrees, that boy is cold. Whew. And all the rest of us are sweating. Anyway, that's part of the hypothalamus function. Now, come on down a few more lines, and you see it says it also produces two additional hormones 
that do not act on the pituitary gland. Antidiuretic hormone, what do you think that would work on? And oxytocin, what would it work on? Okay. All right, so much for the, the uh, hypothalamus. Let's go over to 435, and you see the cerebellum in the second column. And you see it says this posterior and inferior portion of the brain is under this lobe. What's the lobe back here? It's under that lobe. So I could ask a question like that. Under what lobe do you find the cerebellum? And you would say, I'll let you answer that on question uh, exam five. It has two hemispheres, kind of like the, the cerebrum, but there's a big worm in the middle. They call it the vermis because it looks like a worm. And you already know it's involved with coordination and so forth. Uh, look at the next paragraph. And you see uh, it says the cerebellar interior is arranged in the same way as the cerebrum. Outer layer of gray matter, cerebellar cortex, inner layer of white matter. And that deep white matter, keep reading. Since the cerebellar cortex is so extensively folding, the branching white matter is called arbor. They call it arbor vitae. Some people call it arbor vitae. That's some of the inconsistency of us in terms of our language. We'll see more and more of it. You can go to um, Google and say, how to pronounce this, and you can get two or three different ways to pronounce stuff. Anyway, we managed to make it somehow. So you know the arbor body, that's the tree of life. Okay. And you see the last sentence, the role of the cerebellum in movement. Uh, as well as interacting with the cortex and so forth. So very important in moving, rhythmically moving. Now we come down on page 435 to the brain stem. And notice the second letter. In terms of our immediate survival, it is the most important part of the brain. It's nuclei. What are nuclei? Those are gatherings of neuron cell bodies control many basic homeostatic functions. Maintenance of heart rate. You and I go to sleep tonight and Lord, we hope we wake up in the morning, don't we? Heart rate. Your breathing rhythm and so forth. Maybe those folks that have to have, a, they call it a CPAP, maybe they have a little problem with one of those homeostatic mechanisms in the brain stem. To make them breathe. I don't have to have that. I'm so glad. I'm blessed. I don't have to go wear all that stuff. But you do what you got to do if you got the problem. As you come on down from about breathing rhythm, you can come down uh, one, two, three lines of brainstem controls numerous reflexes. One of the reflexes is vomiting. All right. Got a lot of reflexes in there. Come on down to the last paragraph on page 435. And you see it says the brain, the second line in there, brainstem is located inferior to the diencephalon and so forth. And notice it says uh, it extends to the level of the foramen magnum. I know you know that. That's a big hole in it. Foramen magnum. Some of you probably like to watch their movies, magnum. Uh, but anyway, it goes through the occipital bone, and then, of course, it becomes, at that point, the spinal cord. Uh, one of the things, one of the cavities that's in the brain stem is the fourth ventricle. Now, we mentioned the third ventricle, the thalamus. Got a right and a left there. That's your third ventricle. And you go on down, and you hit another cavity called the fourth ventricle, and it runs into the central canal and spinal cord. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. Now, just to get you thinking a little bit more about the cerebellum, um, as you look at the top picture, 
when you look at the first on the left hand side, you see vermis that reminded people of a worm. You come all the way to the bottom of that still upper left picture, and you see left cerebellar hemisphere, and you have a right cerebellar hemisphere. Now look at the sagittal section. Look at the picture, figure of 1211C. You look in there and you see all that white matter. It looks kind of like the tree trunks and so forth, the leaves on it. That's your arbor vitae. And you can see it over here in the real picture. Got two real pictures here. So it's actually the, uh, yep, same picture. Same picture over here on page 437. Okay. Now, page 437. As you look at that picture, the top picture and the bottom picture, you have a mid-sagittal section. Remember that term? Whoa, what? Can you pick that up with a ball of blood and throw the guy out at first place with that? Anyway, we're looking at a mid-sagittal section. So as you look at the picture up top, you see uh, the corpus callosum. Those were the commissural fibers that connect the two hemispheres. There's a little connection between the thalamus, two thalamus bodies. You have a little uh, something like this in there. Space in my hand would be the, the third ventricle. And uh, my right hand here would be a thalamus. That would be a thalamus. And then you have this little bar going across. Some people have it. Some people don't. A lot of girls have it. Not sure exactly what that does. They call it an inter, I-N-T-E-R, interthalamic, T-H-A-L-A-M-I-C, adhesion. Don't know exactly what it does. It's there. Now, I want you to look where, um, see where the corpus callosum is? And you look, it looks like you got a little cavity in there, don't you? And you do have a cavity in there. Now look up to the left, and you see lateral ventricle. So you have a lateral ventricle. Inside the right cerebral hemisphere, you have a lateral ventricle in the left cerebral hemisphere. So we have two lateral ventricles, and they're, we're going to look at them in a few minutes. Here, and then they join, and there's a little opening that allows the fluid to go into the third ventricle, and then there's a small canal we'll talk about in just a minute, and goes into a fourth ventricle. So you have one, two, three, four ventricles in your brain. Now, it may be a little difficult to picture, and when you see the, the outline of it, you're going to think, wow, that's just amazing. Let's go over to um, page 438. Tell you what, look, before we do that, let's do this. Let's look on 437 and look at the bottom of the, either one of those pictures is okay, the picture up top or the real brain at the bottom. Locate at the bottom of the picture, brain stem. And now you see midbrain, pons, and medulla. We'll call it a medulla. You, you don't go to dual parties, do you? You go to dull parties, right? Medulla, medulla oblongata. Anyway, brain stem is made of those three structures. Now, having said that, and you have some sort of a picture that you can study, let's look over on page 438. Page 438, first column, you come to midbrain. And you look in the second line, it says midbrain is found just inferior to the diencephalon. Another word, inferior, right? It surrounds a channel. Here's that little channel called the cerebral aqueduct, which connects the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. You're going to see all that in just a little bit. 
I think. I think we knew that. So that fluid is flowing through the lateral ventricle into the third ventricle, down through the cerebral aqueduct, a little tiny little cavity, a little canal, and then it goes into the fourth ventricle. And it goes somewhere else after that. We'll get to that in a little bit. Now let's look at the midbrain. That's the top portion of the brainstem. You come down to the bottom and you see these terms, superior and inferior colliculi. There are four of them. Two superior ones and uh, two inferior ones. So, what you want to know is you look at the last couple of sentences of dealing with the superior and inferior colliculi. The structures are involved with visual and auditory functions. Visual and auditory functions. They play a role in you responding to things visually, responding to them quickly, maybe you run to it or get away from it. Same thing with um, auditory uh, information. You hear certain sounds and it might scare you. So they're involved in responding to visual or aud and auditory events. That's all we're going to say about the midbrain. Aren't you glad? Got a lot of things in there, but we just can't cover it all. Yay, we can't cover it all. Right? It is a lot. <clears throat> I want you to look page 439. Come Start at the top. You see the diencephalon. Then you come down to the left a little more midbrain. And now we're into what's called the pons number of things there. We're not going to learn them all, but it's called the pons. Pons actually means sort of a bridge. And you look down at the bottom, you see the word pons. Now go over to the next column. This is on 439, bottom paragraph. And you see uh, in the bottom paragraph, certain nuclei, groups of cell bodies, help regulate movements for breathing. Okay. Participate in reflexes, and some are involved in complex functions such as sleep and awakening. That wasn't too bad, was it? Now, 440. And you see the term medulla oblongata. Some people just call it the medulla. Okay. Blends in with the spinal cord as it goes through the foramen. Magna. Now, on the anterior surface of the medulla, that's going to be the surface that if you went straight through um, your mouth back there and went and got, got into the um, back of your skull, just before that uh, brain stem goes through the foramen magnet, you would be there at the medulla. It has a couple of elevated ridges they call pyramids. Now notice what the pyramids contain. Upper motor neuron fibers of the corticospinal tract. Now there's a, a number of things here that teach you certain things. Upper motor neurons. What do motor neurons do? They transmit messages from the cerebral, excuse me, from the cerebrum down to go out through the body to the organs, the effectors, the muscles, the glands, okay? Motor neurons carry messages down to the body so that we can respond to the environment. Now notice it says, of the corticospinal tract. Tracts, bundles of myelinated nerves in the central nervous system, okay? Corticospinal means the neuron began in the cortex and it's going to end somewhere in the spinal cord. It's a big word, but it tells you where it originates and it tells you where it terminates. So let the language speak to you. You've already had terminology to some degree. 
So let it talk to you. This is what you got to get used to anyway. You're going into some kind of medical field. Okay. Yeah, I want you to follow with me here. Come on down. Um, after you see corticospinal tract, you see the little parenthesis there, that come from motor areas of the cerebral cortex. Just mentioned that. Within the pyramids, most fibers of the right and left corticospinal tracts do something interesting. They cross over. Right there. This is why when somebody has a stroke that's going to affect their arms or legs, if, it, if the stroke is on the right side, it's the left side that suffers because of that crossing over. Decusation. Okay? So that's how you can tell where, at least grossly speaking, where the stroke is. Okay? All right. Now, let's go over to page 443. Got a few more minutes here. We want to talk about the, uh, let's see, what have we been going? Oh, we've been going 51 minutes. I'll finish that maybe tomorrow, okay? We might have uh, two parts to chapter 12, and we'll see how 13 and 14 turn out. But we'll start on that tomorrow morning, and uh, maybe I'll get that to you maybe tomorrow evening or whatever. All right, so... Uh, Study. Be ready on Thursday. See you later.